welcome back. Uh, in the last lecture, I introduced the concept of options and uh, explained that uh, options comprise of contracts, whereby one of the parties, which is long in the option, has a right to exercise the option and thereby buy or sell the underlying asset at a certain price on a certain date. Whereas, the other party to the option, which is said to be short in the option, uh, has the obligation to deliver the asset at that particular price on that particular date, the second party that is the short party has no discretion. We also discussed certain terminology, certain uh, varieties of options, the European option and the American option. We talked about the call option and the put option. Call option is an option that gives you the right to buy the asset at a predetermined price and the put option uh, gives you the right to sell the asset at a predetermined price. Uh, then I introduce the basic uh, payoff profiles or payoff diagrams in context of long calls and long puts and then short calls and short puts. And I explained that since this is a zero sum game, therefore the payoff of a long call is the mirror image of the payoff of a short call and similarly for the put options. Now, we also discussed issues relating to investor perception when he takes up certain strategies. For example, if he takes up a long call, as you can see on this uh, screen in fact, if he takes up a long call, he makes a profit uh, if the, uh, the stock price or the underlying price goes up and the profit is unbounded. In other words, the profit goes on increasing as the price of the underlying increases, this angle is 45 degrees. So, one, one unit of money increase in the, in the stock price, in the price of the underlying is reflected by a same amount of increase in the price, in the profit provided of course, provided of course, uh, the underlying price exceeds a certain minimum that is k. k is the threshold price because below k, the long party will not exercise the option, it will find it more profitable to buy the asset from the market rather than exercising the option and therefore, the option will expire worthless. However, once the threshold price k is reached by the market, uh, every unit increase in price of the underlying asset is reflected by an equal increase in, pro in profit of the, uh, of the uh, long party. Uh, the now, if you compare these two strategies, the long call and the short put, uh, you will find that both of, both of them uh, have, a, have a certain uh, perception that the stock price is going to increase. In both cases, if you look at it, the, the party is making a profit if the stock price increases. Long call, the profit is unbounded, but in the short put, the profit is bounded and is confined to the amount of premium that the party has received on the short put. What is actually happening is it is in a sense a passive situation, whereas in the case of a long call, we have an active situation where the price increase is, more, is mirrored in the, in the profit profile. In the case of a short put, uh, the profit arises from the non-exercise, the profit arises from the non-exercise of the option by the party who has bought the option. In other words, what is happening is, if the price is higher, then the party who is long in the option, long in the put option would rather sell in the market and therefore, the option, the put option will expire worthless and the party who is short in the option will pocket the premium. This is, this portion is reflecting that particular aspect. In other words, the profit that you are generating here is merely because of the fact, is merely because of the fact that the party who is long in the option is not exercising the option. It is a kind of a default situation rather than by design. Anyway, so now let us continue from where we left off. Uh, let us talk about put call parity. Put call parity as you can understand from the very terminology is a parity relationship is a kind of an equivalence relationship between the prices of the put option and the call option. The inter -say relation between the premia or the prices of put and call at any instant of time provided they relate to the same underlying asset have the same maturity and for the moment we are assuming that both of them are European options. So, to reiterate 
both of them are European options, both of them have the same maturity and both of them have the same underlying asset. These three are mandatory specifications which we are assuming for the moment. We may relax one or two of them later, but for the moment we are assuming that these three conditions, these three prerequisites are satisfied. I repeat same expiration, same underlying asset and same type that is European options. Again we invoke the principle of arbitrage. This arbitrage is very ubiquitous, very very uh, common whenever we talk about pricing or a similar equivalence relationship between to uh, uh, of a particular financial asset. What, what, how, what is the strategy of this? The strategy of this is that we construct two portfolios. Uh, the portfolio, one of the portfolios comprises of instruments about which we do not know much, the prices of which we do not know or we want to ascertain and the other, other portfolio comprises of uh, those assets of which we are familiar with the prices or we, we have information about their prices. So, let us start uh, portfolio A we construct which comprises of a long call, you are buying a call option, you are paying a price small c, it is a European call, so we are using small c here. So, you are paying a price of minus c, it is an outflow and you sell a put that is you are shorting a put option. Since you are shorting a put option, you it is a cash inflow for you, you are writing the option, you will get the premium. So, you get plus p that is again a small p because it is European options. Let us see their payoffs. Now, the entire spectrum of stock prices from 0, the, the, the minimum stock price at maturity of the option can take the value 0, it can never be negative. So, the minimum stock price is 0 and the maximum stock price is unbounded, we say we can it can go up to infinity for the moment let us assume it that way. We split this entire spectrum of uh, stock prices into two parts by the exercise price k. In other words, we, we partition the entire uh, number uh, the, the entire ray from 0 to infinity into two parts that is 1 0 to k that is the first region and the second partition is from k to infinity. The entire stock price must lie somewhere in this it cannot go, it cannot be negative and if uh, uh, it will either lie between 0 and k or it will lie beyond k. So, the entire stock price must lie on one of these two reasons or it can also be equal to k of course, but which is uh, uh, you know as you will see later uh, at, at st equal to k uh, this uh, profile turns out to be continuous. So, it does not work, does not affect our um, analysis. So, coming back to it, uh, a long call, if S t is less than k that is if the, if the market price is lower than the exercise price, remember the, uh, the long call is the right to buy the asset, buy the underlying asset. So, if S t is less than k, you would rather buy it in the market, the option will expire worthless and therefore, there would be no payoff from the long call if S t is less than k. On the other hand, if S t happens to be greater than S t is a random variable, S t can take any values on this number line, we do not know which value it is going to take. So, we have to explore both the uh, both the scenarios, first scenario that S t ends up at the maturity of the option in this domain or it ends up in this partition. And if S t is greater than k, I will buy the asset at k and sell it at S t. So, my payoff is S t minus k that is what is being shown here. Let us look at the put option. Now, a long put is the right to sell the asset. If the market price is lower and, and, the, and the exercise price is higher, I will exercise the put option. The party who is long in the put option will exercise the put option and sell it at the higher price k, buy the asset at the lower price in the market and sell it at a higher price k. So, you will make a profit of k minus st the long put will give me a payoff of k minus s t if s t is less than k. Why? Because I will sell at k, I will buy at s t, I will make a profit of k minus s t. A long and short manifest themselves as mirror images of each other. So, in this case 
the payoff turns out to be minus k minus s t that is s t minus k. And of course, if s t is greater than k then the option will not be accessed because I would rather sell it in the market than exercise the option and sell at a lower price. So, the payoff from the option will be 0, the option will be allowed to lapse by the party who is long and therefore, the party who is short will not incur any cash outflow. So, adding up these two we end up with a total uh, payoffs at maturity now capital T is the maturity of the uh, of the option contract at maturity in both cases if S T is less than K or S T is greater than K in both cases we end up with a with a payoff of S T minus K and the net price of setting up of this uh, portfolio is a, a, in, a, if you look at it in terms of cost, the cost of buying the option was C, the cost uh, of which P was recouped. So, in terms of cost it is C minus P uh, and in terms of if you look at it algebraically it turns out to be P minus C. Right. Now, what we do is as I mentioned at the beginning of this argument, uh, what we do is we construct two portfolios. So, one portfolio we have already discussed. The second portfolio that we construct is in is to be in such a way that it also generates the same payoff as we had for the first portfolio. So, portfolio A if you recall had a payoff S t minus k, S t minus k and an algebraic uh, cash flow of P minus c, p was the inflow, c was the outflow. So, the net, uh, net uh, inflow was P minus c. Now, we look at portfolio B. Remember, we need to replicate this and this. So, how do we do it? We buy one unit of this stock. We buy one unit of this stock, it will cost at S naught because we are buying it today at t equal to 0. If we are buying it today at t equal to 0, the price I will pay is today's market price of the of the stock which is S naught and this will be an outflow. So, there is a minus sign here. So, I will buy one unit of the stock which will cost me S naught being an outflow it will carry a minus sign. And when I sell this asset that sell this stock on the date of maturity of the option I will get S capital T which is the then prevailing then prevailing market price of this particular uh, uh, this stock that I had purchased at T equal to 0. In other words I buy the stock at T equal to 0 keep it with me over the period 0 to T and when the option matures I sell the stock in the market and I get a sum of money which is S capital T. Now, please note this is independent of the states that we have S T less than K, S T is greater than K. In either case the stock is going to yield the market price which is S T. Whether, whether that S T happens to be less than K or greater than K, but it will remain S T. At the same time I borrow an amount, now, now look at this. The ST part we have been able to replicate, ST and ST has been replicated, but K is yet to be replicated. In fact, we need to replicate minus K. So, in order to replicate minus K, minus K means there, there has to be an outflow at this point. So, there has to be an inflow at this point and therefore, I borrow. And what do I borrow? I borrow the present value of K, because this amount the present value of k borrowed at t equal to 0 will result in a, 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 a repayment equal to k at t equal to capital k, t that is the maturity of the option. So, I borrow an amount k e to the power minus r t continuous compounding. So, k e to the power minus r t will give me on maturity this and this. So, Using these two strategies, what I have I done in portfolio B? What do I have? I have one unit of the stock and I borrow a certain amount of money. And by using a combination of these two, I have been able to replicate exactly the cash flows of portfolio A. In other words, now I have two portfolios, portfolio A and portfolio B, which give me the same cash flows on maturity date of the option contracts. Remember put and call have the same maturity. So, there is only one maturity date. Now, because these two have this same cash flows and because there is no change in, change in the risk profile and that is also important. Uh, 
the cash flows are the same, the risk is unchanged, we are not accounting for any changes in risk. Therefore, the prices of the two portfolios must be the same, otherwise arbitrage will take place. Remember, we are using risk free rate here, this is this, this amount, this uh, stock is with us. So, there, uh, so, as far as holding this stock is concerned, it is lying with us. This put and call options are, are, are assumed to be default free. So, uh, the entire scenario is, uh, is risk free and therefore, we can equate the prices of the two portfolios and what do we get? We get P minus C is equal to minus S naught plus K e to the power minus R T. On realignment, we get K e to the power minus R T plus C is equal to P plus S naught. This is a very important relationship in uh, uh, option theory and it is called put call parity in relation to European options. C plus K e to the power minus R t is equal to P plus S naught. Remember, P is the price of the put option, the premium on the put option, S naught is the price of the underlying, the current price of the underlying, S naught, not S t, today's price of the underlying asset. K is the strike price of the of both the options, which is assumed to be the same, and C is the premium on the call option. Now, what happens? or how does arbitrage, I just mentioned that for no arbitrage we need this and we, we end up with this particular relationship. Then the question arises that if this relationship or for a let us say for a particular at a particular point in time uh, due to certain spontaneous uh, factors or certain anomalies, uh, this relationship does not hold, the equality does not hold. Let us assume that S naught plus P is less than uh, is in C plus K e to the power minus R T. Then how will arbitrage take place? How can an, a market player uh, take advantage of this situation to make a riskless profit? That is the next question that we are going to address. So, uh, le uh, let us see, we are given this quant, we are given this. So, at the very outset what do I see? At if no arbitrage is to prevail, this equality has to hold. But in actual practice, what is there? This less than is, is holding for the moment. Less than means this quantity is smaller, this quantity is larger. Therefore, what I will do is, I will long this quantity and I will short this quantity. In other words, I will buy this quantity, the left hand side and I will sell the right hand side. Let us see this stepwise process by which I can achieve that. Because if I buy at a lower price and I sell at the higher price, I make a profit. So, let us see how it takes place. Since I am selling the right hand side, I will write a call option. So, I write a call option, I get a, the call premium, it is an inflow for me, so I get C plus C. It is an inflow, so I get plus C. And what is the payoff on maturi uh, maturity of the call? It will be negative of the long call and the payoff of the long call is 0 if S t is less than k and if S t is greater than k, it is S t minus k and now it is a short call. So, there will be a minus sign here. In other words, it will be k minus S t. Then I, I as I mentioned, I have to short this, short means borrowing. So, I borrow an amount k e to the power minus r t. It is a borrowing, it is an inflow. So, I get an amount k e to the power minus r t and on maturity, I will have to pay back an amount how much? I will have to pay back its future value at t equal to capital T which turns out to be k. Future value of this amount compounded at there is uh, at, the, at the rate r for time t will give me k. Now, this has to be paid, so it is an outflow, so it becomes minus k and this is independent of the state at which or, or, the, or, the, or the price of the uh, underlying asset, it has to be paid irrespective of the price market price of the underlying asset. So, in either case it is minus k. Now, let us look at the left hand side, we have to go long on this, long means we will buy the stock. So, we buy the stock, we are buying the stock, so it is a cash outflow at t equal to 0, I pay an amount S naught and I get 1 unit of the stock, so I get this and this, this 1 unit of stock when I sell in the market at t equal to capital T, I get S t in both cases. 
again it is independent of the state of the of the world which arises or which occurs at maturity of the option I will still get S t whatever that S, S t happens to be. And I also have to go long in this since I have to go long in this I will buy this option I will buy the put option I will buy the put option. So, I will pay a price for this and see minus sign it is a cash outflow and what will be the payoff payoff will be k minus S t if the option is excised and when will the option be excised the option will be excised if S t is less than k and in the second case S t greater than k the option will not be exercised and we will have a payoff of 0. Let us add all these things if you add all these things here in both cases you are getting 0 in other words there is no net net payoff in either of the two situations on maturity there is no net payoff in either of the two situations on maturity. Therefore, what should happen? Therefore, the price the, the, these all these commodities these, these uh, flows these cash flows plus c plus k to the power r t minus s naught minus p. If there were if there were no arbitrage this should have been 0 also because there is no payoff here. So, this should have been 0, but we are given we are given that this inequality holds because this inequality holds c plus k e to the uh, you, um, c plus k e to the power minus r t minus s naught minus p turns out to be greater than 0. If you take these two quantities to the right hand side you find that 0 is less than this or this this whole thing is greater than 0. In other words what is happening the payoff here is 0 here you are having a, a certain uh, positive cash flow that means you are making a riskless profit that is how arbitrage will take place you will make a riskless profit and because you x y z a b c everybody will start do doing this process the prices will realign themselves the prices will realign themselves so that at equilibrium this this left hand side which was underpriced will increase in price because there will be a greater demand for this everybody will be buying the left hand side and selling the right hand side. So, the price of the left hand side will increase the price of the right hand side will decrease and as a result of which the equality or the parity will be restored at equilibrium that is how this arbitrage process will take place. Uh, uh, just to, uh, to uh, remind uh, in this case we are having a payoff of 0. So, if no arbitrage is to take place this side should also be totaling to 0, but it is turning out to be positive. In other words in other words this ex this difference is something which is simply a riskless profit for you. If you do all these strategies you end up with no liabilities no uh, liabilities at t equal to capital T and you still have a positive cash flow at t equal to 0. So, you are generating a positive cash flow without any obligation so that is what is a riskless profit. Now, we have talked about the put call parity in a very general scenario in a very restricted scenario where uh, there was no income uh, related to the carrying of the underlying asset. If you recall uh, uh, one of the portfolios uh, let us go back let me uh, you bought the stock and you held it from the period t equal to 0 to t equal to capital T, but you did not account for any income or any expense in holding this asset. In other words we assume that there is no carrying cost of the underlying asset neither is there any income generated by the holding of the asset during this period of 0 to t. t today and the maturity of the option you are holding the underlying asset does not generate any income and does not entail any expenditure as well. We now modify this, uh, this uh, assumption and we talk about a situation where, where uh, holding this asset results in a let us say results in a dividend. Now, in this case we again construct two portfolios I have modified the portfolio actually this portfolios A and B are not sacrosanct. Uh, let me explain again uh, let us go back again you see in portfolio A I had call long call short put and portfolio B I had long stock and borrowing 
you can always migrate between these two portfo uh, portfolios A and B. In other words, instead of having uh, a short put in portfolio A, you have a long put in portfolio B and you instead of borrowing in portfolio B, you invest in portfolio A, you can as well construct that portfolio and the result would be exactly the same, it does not make any difference because it is simple algebraic substitution. It is nothing more than an algebraic manipulation. So, however, these four things, four quantities are there, how you arrange them in two different portfolios does not influence the result. That is why I have taken two different combinations of portfolios A and B just to uh, uh, justify this particular uh, argument or just um, justify this particular uh, contention. Uh, so, in this case what we do is we start with a long call that same as in the previous case. So, you, uh, you buy a call, so you pay a price of equal to the premium of the call and the payoff is 0 and S T minus K as we have discussed in a, a lot of detail. Now, instead of investing this amount, now in, 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 the, in the previous case what did we do? We borrowed an amount equal to this, but we did it in portfolio B. Now, I have shifted this, this particular part of the portfolio or section of the portfolio to portfolio A. So, I have reversed the sign and instead of borrowing, I will now invest. So, I have invested an amount k e to the power minus r t, right. Uh, this is equal to or this is equivalent to borrowing an amount k e to the power minus r t in portfolio B, it's simple algebra. Uh, now, if you put this here, now we have to talk about the dividend. Let us assume that the dividend is paid, obviously it will be paid somewhere between 0 and t, other, only then it is relevant to us. If it is paid after t, then it does not become relevant to us. So, let us assume that it is paid somewhere, let us say at t equal to tau, some point in time between 0 and t, uh, the, the underlying asset pays a dividend. What you do is, because it pays a dividend, holding that asset, uh, the cost of holding the asset, the, uh, the cost of carrying the asset reduces. Originally, if there was no dividend, you have to pay the entire price of the asset for buying the asset in the market. Now, you can part finance. Let us say originally, the, uh, the you paid a price of S naught to acquire one unit of the asset from the market, the underlying asset. Now, what will happen if you, if because if you are buying this asset, you will get some dividend. You can borrow a certain amount of money against this dividend and part finance this S naught by the present value of the dividend. So, the net cost that is that you have to pay or uh, for buying the asset is not S naught now, but it is S naught minus D naught because d naught is 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 up, is arising merely out of holding the asset and this d naught is the it is the present value of d tau d, uh, the actual dividend that you receive is d tau the present value of that is d naught and that d naught amount uh, uh, you can uh, set off against the cost of the asset and your net cost will turn out to be the d uh, s naught minus d naught uh, or looking at it in a different way, uh, against the, the projected dividend of d tau, you can borrow an amount equal to d naught and that d naught uh, can be used for part, part financing of S naught. Anyway, we will come back to it. So, because this issue will come into play when we talk about portfolio B. So, instead of uh, investing only this amount k e to the power minus r t, I have now to invest k e to the power minus r t minus d naught, where d naught is the present value of d tau. Actual, actual dividend re received is d tau and it is received at uh, time t equal to tau, but today's worth of that particular tau is d naught and that is what we are going to borrow. So, what happens to this amount? When I repay this, I have to pay k corresponding to this and d t, which is the future value. You see, I have borrowed d, d naught and the amount that I have to repay is the future value of d naught calculated at t equal to capital T, that is the maturity date of the option. 
So, uh, j just re recall d tau is the actual dividend that you receive at t equal to tau, d naught is the present value of that dividend which you can which you can borrow or you can invest as the case may be and d t is the amount that you will receive if you invest this amount d naught at, at, at time t equal to capital T. So, that is how it operates. So, your cash flows relating to this will be k plus d t k plus d t in either case it does not get influenced by s t minus k or s t greater than k in either case it will be this much. So, this is the total total in either case. Now, let us look at the second portfolio you are buying this stock you are long in this stock. So, you have to pay a price s naught there is no problem with this, but when you pay the price s naught what you have, what happens you get a dividend also d tau as I have been talking you get a dividend d tau at t equal to tau this dividend what will be its future value its future value at t equal to capital T will be d t. So, when you in other words the mere fact the mere fact that you are holding this stock as t equal to 0 will give you how much cash flow at t equal to capital T. Number 1 it will give you by selling the stock you will get S t S capital T that is when you sell the stock at t equal to capital T, but in addition to that the amount d tau that you receive here would have been reinvested by you and you will get the future value of d tau at t equal to capital T which is d t. So, the total cash flow that you get by holding the stock or by buying the stock at t equal to 0 and holding it up to t equal to capital T is not merely s t it is s t plus the future value of dividend that you receive during the period 0 to capital T. So, that this is the total cash flow that you receive merely by holding this stock and you are, uh, when you buy a put option you pay a price for this right and, and the payoff from the put option is k minus s t because you are long in the put option. So, the total if you look at this the total of these two expressions happens to be k plus d t k plus d t in portfolio a as well and if you look at uh, the second case s t plus d t s t plus d t. So, the cash flows exactly match the cash flows exactly match as t equal to capital T precisely match. So, they must cost the same at t equal to 0 therefore, the or you can put it this way the cash flows because they match exactly at t equal to capital T they must also match at t equal to 0 because the intermediate cash flows is also accounted for in terms of its future and present values. Therefore, we must have minus c minus k e to the power r t minus t 0 is equal to minus s naught minus p or you eliminate all the negative signs. And as I mentioned earlier my carrying cost has come down my, my purchase cost of the of the underlying asset has come down by the present value of dividend you can look at it this way as I said you can simply assume that the the dividend that you receive during the life of the uh, life of the option due to due to the under holding the underlying asset you can borrow an amount equal to the present value of the dividend and finance part of the part of the cost of acquisition of the underlying asset from that present value of dividend. Thank you we will continue after the break.